Hey guys, recently I've had several requests to review this article that a neuroscientist wrote on cerebral lysin, in which he basically tries to discredit over 70 years of this peptide research, but he demonstrates a completely rudimentary understanding of how peptides even function in the body. For example, he says that they can't cross the blood-brain barrier, and that they must in order to exert neurotrophic effects, and he also interchangeably uses the term peptides and proteins. So I just want to review this article with you guys. But first, what is cerebral lysin? It is a brain peptide hydrolysate, which was discovered by Dr. Gerard Herrer, an Austrian scientist, in the 1940s, and it's been used in most of Europe since the 1950s for various CNS and brain disorders. All right, so let's jump right into this article, guys. Everform has claimed that it contains neurotrophic peptides in therapeutic quantities is likely false. HPLC and other evidence shows cerebral is composed of amino acids, phosphates, and salt, along with some random protein fragments. Okay, I guess they're referring to the 638 unique peptides found in cerebral lysin as random protein fragments. Many scientific papers on cerebral lysin appear to have ties to its manufacturer, Everpharma, and sometimes those ties are not reported. Okay, how would you know if they're not reported and not listed in this funding section? I mean, cerebral lysin has been studied in multiple different countries around the world for 70 years now. There have been several hundred studies conducted on cerebral lysin, including by highly reputable nonprofit organizations such as the Cochrane Collaboration, who has done systematic reviews on cerebral lysin and found it to consistently be beneficial. It's also been studied by the CAPTAIN trials, which assessed it for Alzheimer's disease, in which it's also been found to be consistently beneficial. Everfarmer's explanation of how putative peptides in cerebral lysin cross the blood-brain barrier does not make sense and flies in the face of scientific research which shows that most peptides do not cross the blood-brain barrier, including neurotrophic peptides like BDNF, CDNF, and GDNF. Okay, first of all, BDNF, CDNF, and GDNF are proteins, not peptides, and most small peptides can cross the blood-brain barrier. But even if they don't cross the blood-brain barrier, they can still exert neurotrophic effects. For example, pinealon is a brain peptide, and it binds to the FNDC5 gene, and it stimulates the release of irisin, which is a protein, specifically a myokin, which is released by your muscle cells during exercise as well. And this protein can actually cross the blood-brain barrier, despite being a high molecular weight of 12,000 and some Daltons. And this can exert neurotrophic effects. For example, it activates STAT3 and BDNF in the brain. Since neurotrophic factors are the proposed mechanism for cerebral license actions, it's reasonable to doubt claims of cerebral license efficacy. Unfortunately, most scientific research is false. It may have mild therapeutic effects in some contexts, but the research on this is shaky. It is likely safe to inject in small quantities, but is almost certainly a waste of money for anyone looking to improve their cognitive functions. Okay, first off, the neurotrophic factors being the proposed mechanism of action. Uh, yeah, I just explained that. Unfortunately, most scientific research is false. I don't know how you can say most of it is false. It's been studied more than any pharmaceutical drug on the market today and consistently been found to be beneficial by multiple different studies conducted in multiple different countries. And I don't know how you could say it has mild therapeutic effects in some contexts because, for example, it's been sufficiently studied in Alzheimer's disease in which it's been found to be more effective than acetylcholinosterase inhibitors like donopezil. And I thought you would really appreciate this considering that you have actually written an article on IGF-2 in terms of its beneficial effects in Alzheimer's disease. And cerebral lysin activates IGF-2 through the sonic hedgehog pathway, and it also has many other beneficial effects showing its usefulness in Alzheimer's disease. I mean, those CAPTAIN trials are a series of a lot of different studies, and they've been conducted on multiple occasions, and it's been found to consistently be beneficial in all of them. So to completely ignore that, but then focus on IGF-2, which is one of the things that cerebral lysin activates downstream, I just don't really get it, to be honest with you. And it's unlikely safe in anything but small quantities. Okay, well, cerebral lysin has been studied up to 60 milliliters in an escalated dose response, and it's been found to be safe and devoid of side effects. And in fact, can you name any pharmaceutical drug which has never been shown to have adverse effects and also uh, never result in any deaths? I mean, cerebral lysin has been in use for 70 years, and any side effect ever reported has just been mild, and it's never been associated with any deaths in any of the time. So I would say it's one of the safest compounds ever produced, and it's also safe to inject in very large quantities. Okay, certainly not something you should be concerned about injecting in small quantities. And yeah, that's basically it, guys. Uh and this was Brennan Henry, the world's leading expert in peptide science, bringing you another video on debunking mainstream peptide information. If you haven't seen my video on why your MOT C dose might be 17 times too low, make sure to check it out and keep in mind that while cerebral lysin has been studied at up to 60 milliliters per day, that doesn't mean it's most effective at that dose for all conditions. To combat this confusion, I've created a comprehensive dosing reference on my cheat sheet inside my peptide mastery course, which is also the first course to comprehensively cover all 40 Cognizance peptides and 26 additional ones, with detailed guidance on how to use them effectively for your personal needs. 
I also have a free Peptide Mastery course linked in the description. It includes several detailed peptide analysis videos and a great introductory PDF on peptides. Don't forget, I have a lot of free resources on my blog, including the most heavily scientifically backed and cited article on the pinealon peptide ever written. Thanks for watching, and have a good day.